means that we cannot change that. Um, you know, there is no way that we can change that, and that creates a fairly highly competitive situation with Michael Heiser. And uh, uh, I don't see a way around that. If I come up with one, I will, but that's fine. We will have a, uh, a, a, the benefit, a cornucopia of wealth. You cannot do everything at these conferences. They can be set up so you can, but there's a reason they're not. You, we want you to, to, to be coming back for more. We want you to know that there's more that you can see. So if you have to miss something this time, you get it the next time. Well, of course we want you to buy all the DVDs. That's a given, Ted. <laughs> By the way, we do have, we do have, uh, we do have uh, some staff now that are going to be working the, the extremely large uh, uh, de uh, tables out there for the, for the tapes. Uh, all of the ex-conference tapes, a uh, percentage goes to PRG, uh, and uh, you're helping us out with that, uh, whether it's last year's or this year's. But Ted has, of course, several hundred thousand other titles and, and uh, puts in an unbelievable amount of work uh, to create those titles. Uh, and he's paid yeah, basically nothing. You know. <laughs> he doesn't get anything uh, to do it. Uh, but uh, he is building the largest library, maybe one other is larger, Tim Crawford's. And so when disclosure comes, Ted is going to be driving around a Maserati, okay? And hopefully we'll be taking care of me. <laughs> we'll all be parting. Uh, so that's the other and the last announcement, taking up a little bit of time. So we'll, we'll, we'll launch. This is put us slightly behind during the day, but nothing serious. And remember, we've got two one-hour breaks in here, so it's not a problem. Oh, uh, one other thing. Uh, we still have tickets to Jaime Moussan. And uh, if you're not signed up for Jaime Moussan, you, you are making a grave mistake, all right? You have to be here for this. Jaime Moussan is uh, presenting now at, on, a, on a basis of four to five times a week all over the country of Mexico with audiences between one and 2,000 people. There is nothing comparable to that here, nothing at all comparable. Now, it helps that extraterrestrials have been, been traveling around over the skies of Mexico in vast numbers for almost 15 years. And if that were to happen here, you know, we'd be amusing to say the least, and it would probably end the, end, end the truth embargo. But it's happening there, and one can speculate why that is. But Jaime did something that nobody else in this country has dared to do, though at any one moment they could do it. Ted Koppel would be nice. I'll try to make the suggestion to him or maybe to Peter Jennings. He's uh, in an awkward situation now. Maybe he needs to think about the future and the legacy. Uh, Jaime in, in 91 changed his life. I mean, he totally changed his life in an utterly radical way. And all he did was what Frances Barwood did when she was at the council in Arizona uh, in 97. Uh, there were people seeing things all over the skies of Mexico. And they didn't look like anything anybody had seen before. They clearly were not balloons. They, were, they took a few films. Jaime was doing 60 Minutes down there. He uh, took some of them, did a little show, and then, and he was, by the way, a very distinguished High-profile guy. He's Mike Wallace down there, right? Very popular. Uh, and so he went on the show, and he, he did something really radical. He said, you know, y there's something in the skies up there. It looks really interesting. I know that most of you have video cameras now. But would you please go out and take your video cameras and, and frequently check the skies? And if you see something, night or day, would you v film it and send it to me? Fourteen years later, 25,000 videos of which he was able to triage out approximately 22,000, okay? Think about that, folks, triaging 22,000 videos, eliminating the ones that were just, well, you know, a, a, number, a number of them down there uh, were as educated and refined as Jill Tarter, uh, who is currently with the chief scientist at SETI, and, and they mistook the moon for UFO, too, and so they sent those films a bit. But uh, they were quickly, uh, quickly, uh, uh, you know, uh, understood and triaged out. Though I'm going to ask Jaime eventually to send all of those to Jill for her collection, so she can have those. Know that she's not alone in that problem that she and her husband have, which is mistaking the moon for a UFO. Uh, but uh, he now there's about 3,200 that are pretty powerful. 3,200. What would happen if Eraldo Rivera? Let's go up higher than that. Bill Riley, all right, or Ted Koppel, or any number of other pretty high-profile people. Uh, she uh, Shepard Smith comes to mind. He's had me on three times. Great guy. Love Shepard Smith, okay? Simply goes on the national news and says, look, we're seeing some sightings out there. There's probably 200 video cams. They get better all the time. You can now zoom in and see the craters of Mars with the Sony whatever cam cam. And so it's like, why don't you all just carry those around with you and take some shots? You know what would happen? 
within about a year, we'd probably have 10,000 videos in the hands of that news operation. It's interesting, no one's ever made that request here because if they did, they know what would happen, all right? But Jaime did, and Jaime has presented a number of times, but I asked him to come here. This will be the longest presentation he's ever given. It's the first time he's ever given a compilation presentation of everything since 91, okay? You want to be here for this. All right, now, we come to the meat of the heart of, of the exopolitical convention. We have, we have the uh, number of speakers today, and they're deliberately chosen because well, they're all important, but the, there are certain, how would you say, key connections between the speakers today and this issue. Uh, and um, uh, the first one uh, here is not by accident by either, all right? Richard Dolan will be the Will Durant of exopolitics, the man who chronicles in a historical way, okay, Alfred Weber is, is, is not a historian per se. He's a futurist. Michael Sala is a bit of an historian, but he's more in the futurist area as well. He's really political science. Richard, in his unassuming way, uh, has uh, launched on that, that mode. Uh, again, in addition to his family, in addition to another uh, you know, business and career that, that pays the bills, and, and, and launched into history. Straightforward, matter of fact, back it up, do the, do the footnotes, you know, just be discriminate. Woo-woo is fine, but not for the history book. We'll leave it out this time. And he wrote UFOs in the National Security State, Volume 1, I think 47-73. Now, uh, that book has had enormous impact. It hasn't even begun to have the impact it could. It will sell many, many books once it's finally picked up, I think, probably at a very high-end publisher. But it's already sold through several levels, and he's self-selling and all that stuff. So the book's out there, and uh, it's only begun to sell. He's working on the second volume. 2006. Richard left school before he had his PhD. He was moving along, but things were happening. He had his PhD. I'm probably going to have to have a talk with him, right, and suggest when the first opportunity comes along, maybe go back and get that puppy. Because uh, as things develop, I'd like, to, I'd, like to, I'd like to have that PhD by his name, uh, you know, two, three, four, five years down the line, okay, when he's going to be sitting up there with a whole bunch of academic mucky mucks, and they're going to be looking at me going, okay, you were right about the thing, you know, but I got a PhD and you don't, so like, don't get too uppity about that. All right? I know his wife, I know his wife Karen would be happy to support him through that, that, those studies. I'm absolutely sure of this. Uh, so Will Durant, you know who Will Durant is? He and his wife wrote History of Civilization. Well, you know, a lot, no, no other historians have gotten into this except Jacobs, but Jacobs, while he's an historian, associate professor at Temple, he, 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 he didn't, he's not writing history. He launched into the study of the abduction phenomena, and he's an expert there. Uh, but no historian that I'm aware of has taken it on in that fashion. He's the first. First is great. First is cool, but it's also very tough. So he He's easily one of the most lucid people. When you ever see him in a documentary, even some bad ones, he's the one that's going to sound, oh, that's, that makes sense, that's right, that's reasonable. Uh, he's got charisma, he's got photogenic abilities and stuff, which, you know, I used to have, but lost them somewhere. I don't know. How. <laughs> Could have been the medication, whatever. Uh, so he, he's, gonna, he, he's, like, he's like Jonathan Turley. He, he, in fact, he's got almost exactly the, the, the capabilities of being on screen as Jonathan Turley, who is a guy that got into this issue once, and I tried to get him in further, but he said, you know, I did my time, that's it. And so now he's able to come on and talk about constitutional law and a bunch of other stuff. And Jonathan Turley is an important man, and I've invited him to both these conferences. We can't quite make it down here, but that's all right. He's, he's going to be the equivalent to that. You're going to see him on television. So he leads off on Saturday basic stuff. Just like uh, Richard Souter is talking about the basement of the secret empire, he is talking about the base fundamental historical reality that in fact supports all of this. And the fact is, is that if there wasn't a single photograph of an extraterrestrial or a, a UFO anywhere, the historical record as he describes it is confirming of an extraterrestrial present. We'll just give all that evidence away, right? If you are discerning, if you use your faculties and your intelligence and you apply rational thinking, okay? Which is what we're supposed to do. The original founders said, hmm, 
going to keep this thing going for you know five six hundred years going to have free state going to have a whole bunch of rights going to have a complex society going to move on move on and we need a society of people that can apply rational thinking based on a good solid public education and maybe some college and by doing that they will figure out things early they will deal with problems ahead of time their society will be vigorous it was a perfectly sound idea somewhere along the line some people said no 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 let's have America and let's have all the goodies but let's also have a whole lot of 11th century thinking all right? Let's go pre-Renaissance if we can. All right? Let's create sort of a you know, commercial corporate fascist surfism thing, you know? And it'll work. We can meld the 11th and 18th and the 21st century together. It'll work. It'll work. It won't work. These people are idiots. Don't listen to them. When they turn up, right? And they want to they wanna, you read their book. Go read Jefferson. If they want you to watch their, their video, go listen to, you know, a... a, 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 a uh, a book by uh, Adams, you know, the walk-around book, you know, of, J uh, of James Adams. M Madison, James Madison, who was one of the key people in open government and so forth. Those people really had it. People today don't have it. They lost their way, so we're going to help them find their way. won't be easy, but one way to do it is to break this open so the world knows that there is something that was kept from them. Then they'll want to know everything else that was kept from them. And don't be surprised if your next speaker is going to be telling them even that as well. So please welcome vigorously Richard, soon to be Dr. Richard <laughs> Dole. Hello. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was very, very nice. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. We have a darkness descending over our world, don't we? <clears throat> Do you remember about 20 years ago that phrase, a thousand points of light? Isn't that right? Yeah. Shining points of light? That, that's what we are. We, we actually are those points of light because we are actually here to discuss matters of uh, true importance and um, amid a kind of whirlwind of falsehood and lies. And we're going to do it. Now, what I want to talk about today is uh, this whole concept of the knife in the back. And what I, what I will be telling you is that, duh, we don't have the kind of world that we grew up thinking that we were having in terms of the society that, uh, that we would like. And it's uh, part of that reason is because of this topic, the UFO topic. We have an American murder mystery. The question is, what has killed the American Republic? And that may sound a little bit uh, you know, dramatic, but I think the question is quite valid because we don't, again, as I, I will argue, we don't have what we thought we had. And the answer is there, there are many culprits. It's just like that Agatha Christie story, Murder on the Orient Express, everyone did it. But one of those is this, UFO secrecy and uh, what I want to do is to put, to the best extent that we're able to, I mean, we're all in the process of figuring this out, to find the place of UFO secrecy amid all these other difficulties. I mean, look, there are some brilliant people out there today who are well aware of the problems that are going on, and they're writing about this in article and book form, but they're not getting the UFO part. They're not getting it. And so what we want to do is to get that and incorporate it into the, the big picture. This, this is what I grew up with, you know. America version 1.0, what we thought we'd have anyway. Great, great images I, I found here. The one on the left, on your left, a uh, 19th century painting of progress and uh, civilizing the West, getting rid of those, you know, inconvenient inhabitants in the process. And then uh, the one on the right is uh, Captain America with Bucky, his young friend, helping out, fighting Hitler. And I think, you know, World War II is really how America, to this day, we choose to define ourselves, at least uh, publicly. We are the defender of freedom, we say, and an open society, right? And America as the path of progress. And this rhetoric is all around us to this day. Not that half or even a, a quarter of the people actually believe us anymore, because I don't think they do. But we sort of go through the motions and tell ourselves, yeah, yeah, we're the free society. We're, you know, we're great. Everyone else wants to be like us. <laughs> but of course, you know, reality is something a little bit different. I mean, all societies tell themselves wonderful things about themselves, right? 
and America is no different. There are wonderful things about America. I love American history. I've studied it my whole life and uh, will continue to do so, but we have to look with, uh, with a re realistic approach as well. And what we've had, even since before World War II, but let's just take World War II as a good you know, place to start this whole thing. We've gone through some changes here. And what has happened over the last 60 or so years? We've had the growth of a military and intelligence community including <clears throat> the secret importation of Nazis. Not so secret now. In other words, it's, it's known you can go to any library and read about paperclip, and the information's publicly available, which means in practice that nobody knows it because no one reads this stuff. But what we did during World War II is we swallowed that big poison and incorporated, brought these guys into our society. We all know about that. We've had the growth of federal power in our domestic politics and simply, you know, we've, we've developed a system in which we've got organized, legalized bribery, which is how we run things. And by the way, I don't speak as a member of either of the uh, legal political parties, Democrat or Republican. I didn't vote for skull or bones in the last election. So <laughs> I don't want you to think that I'm going at this. I'm glad someone like that. I'm not... Uh, Anything that I say, if it's deemed as political, um, you know, I, I don't belong to either party and, and never will. But what we have is the, this federal behemoth. You can call it a, uh, a military state. You can call it a nanny state. Either way, it's a situation in which we want the state to do all these things for us. But you have to remember, here's the problem with the argument of liberals and so-called liberals and so-called conservatives. You have the so-called liberals to say, well, <clears throat> you know, we have to have the government to help out the unfortunate. And the conservatives say, oh, that's a waste of money. And you have the conservatives that say, well, we have to have government. We have to spend our money on this military to defend freedom. And the liberals don't like that. What I would say is that um, you know, there's two sides of the beast. And if you feed one, you're going to get the other, whether you like it or not. Because that beast will inexorably attempt to expand its domain. So I don't really think it's possible, frankly, the more I think about this, to have the one without the other. Government and the media, I'll talk about this a bit um, as part of the transformation of our society. You know, you have what, five, I think five corporations globally, isn't it right, that control something like 90% of anything you encounter in your day in terms of print media, video, radio, internet, okay? Now, Back in the 1950s, Alan Dulles, who ran CIA, established very, very cozy relationships with major media outlets. Not to say that the CIA totally controlled the media at that time. That's going a bit too far. But they certainly had very, very strong ability to manipulate and uh, manage it. But now, you know, ask yourself what's easier to ha control media if you have to have relationships with 100, say, major corporations, or five. So that's the situation we're at today. And in fact, I, I will uh, suggest that the American corporate media structure today functions exactly, precisely in the way that George Orwell described the Ministry of Truth in his novel 1984. I think the analogy is dead on. What they do is they are the servants of those in power. In fact, it's not even the servants. They're, they're part of the same club. They're all part of the same group. So it's not even accurate to say, does the media work for the government? Does the government work for the media? It's not, it doesn't work like that. I think you've got a, a very, very elite group of, um, of power people, and, and they run things. And the media is simply the, the propagandist organ. And I, and I said uh, yesterday in my talk, and I, I'm dead serious, I do not uh, recommend that anyone get their news primarily from, from television or even your daily newspaper. You can't do it. You can't do it and hope to be untainted <laughs> by, by the, uh, the people giving this to you, because they will define the parameters of what you're supposed to consider news. You can't do that. So what you have to do, there are still bastions of freedom in this world, and they're basically on the internet. And you have to hunt, you have to use your judgment, and find things that are alternative. And I don't mean going to your AOL headlines and, and reading what's on there, because that's the same thing. And what we've had, of course, in the last 50, 60 years is a permanent warfare state. What else can you call this? When have we not... When has America not had troops on the ground in other nations since the end of World War II? The answer is never. And indeed, when has there not been warfare going on? I'm not just talking about the big ones, Vietnam or Korea. I'm talking about uh, police actions 
uh, insurrections, silent coups, not so silent coups around the world. And this is what America has been doing. There are connections with Rome. I now want to talk a little bit about this as another knife in the back of the American Republic. Rome, you know, it's almost a cliche to talk about this. Well, we're the new Rome, but we are, okay, in many, many ways. Nothing is ever the same exactly in history, but there are analogies that we have to remember. This is Rome in around the year 218, 218 BC. Rome was expanding. It had gotten uh, basically all of the Italian peninsula, some of the islands. And Rome had been a republic for centuries by this point, about 300 years. Rome had a heck of an army, we all know, and by 44 BC it was looking like this. This is at the time of the death of Caesar. Now, let's go back here. This is, all right, and now you got this. Now, the Roman Senate was the, the dominant political institution by which they ruled. You ask yourself, how is the Senate going to rule the western part of uh, Hispania or Gaul or you know, what, in the Middle Eastern provinces or, or North Africa? It's not so easy, all right? That was a system designed to rule over Romans in a much earlier period in a much different time. And so what happened by that period, you get this big argument developing between, I forgot my pointer, that guy is Cicero, Marcus Tullius Cicero, and this is Caesar. Cicero was the, really the last great defender of the old Roman Republic when it was still a republic, and not that he didn't have his ulterior motives either, he did, but Cicero really said, look, the Senate's corrupt, I know that, but it's the only bastion of freedom that we have in this society, and we've got to maintain it. And uh, thank oh, a laser pointer. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Very nice of you. There is Cicero. But we should read Cicero, by the way. He's very instructive, worth reading today. I've been, uh, in the last year, I, some voice in my head said, read Cicero. I'm not, you know, basically, and I've, I've read, uh, read his selected works. And here's Caesar, a man of equal intellectual stature, at the least. Caesar was a, a genius as well, but Caesar, Caesar had a different attitude, and he said, no. The Republic is hopelessly corrupt, incapable of rule. We need a different way. Cicero died, then Caesar died, but the Republic was dead as well, and that's what happened. Fast forward to today, okay? This is one way to look at America. It is not the only way to look at America. This is a map of American military bases worldwide, basically today, as far as we can tell. And I say as far as we can tell because we don't actually have full information on this. All right, but these are nations in red where America has military bases. There's over 50 of them, 730 military installations. And this does not include troops on the ground in other nations, which are several dozen. The total is well over 100 nations in the world where the United States has military troops on the ground. I'm not talking about embassy guards. I mean soldiers on the ground with a mission. Now, admittedly, not all of those missions involve a lot of soldiers, but they're there. Some of them do involve a lot of soldiers. Now, you know, just looking at this, um, <clears throat> when you have a military base, a permanent one in a country, that involves a lot of work. It involves a lot of control. And ask yourself, how, how able is Congress to manage this empire? And frankly, there could probably be better maps than this um, in terms of wealth and ownership, but I, I'm working on it. <laughs> It's not easy to put these together. This is, this is an excellent one, though, just on the military side of it. Uh, and yes, let me just emphasize again, we don't know um, where some of these permanent, other permanent bases are because this information is actually classified. So that, uh, some of it is classified. So we actually do not have a full idea. And that's worth thinking about for a moment, isn't it? Now, this is a quote by Machiavelli. I'm very fond of this quote, it's in my book. I've mentioned it from time to time at other conferences. I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but I will paraphrase what Machiavelli said. This is a statement, I think, of true genius. Machiavelli, writing Discourses on Libya 500 years ago, really understood a lot of things. And he said, look, if you really want to have a revolution from above and you want to make it stick so that people accept it, what you have to do is maintain the old forms of power. You have to, the, the structure, the semblance of the old forms of power, because that's all people notice. You could have utter profound changes going on at the deepest levels of your society, and if you keep the old facade, 
the way that it always has been, you'll be fine. Because that's what people know. Now, I have uh, been thinking about this, and I have my own little corollary, I think, to Machiavelli, if I may be so bold. And what I would say is this, that at a certain point, changes are so profound and so dramatic that it does become impossible to maintain those old structures, the, out, the externals. That just like the market has its own corrections to you know, uh, economic realities, so too our political system, the facade, has its own corrections to the deep changes that go on. Because in America's case, those externals are, you know, what, president, Supreme Court, Congress, this type of thing. We have a president today. We had a president 200 years ago. Nothing's changed. Great. Congress. Well, in that, indeed, we are in a completely different world. And every now and then, things have to happen to bring the new reality in line. This was one event. That assassination was one event. There's no question in my mind anymore. This was another. And without getting into the details of what I think happened that day, I still don't have all the facts, none of us do, but I will tell you, I don't believe the official story a whit. There are problems galore. But the thing about 9-11 is the aftermath. And the aftermath of 9-11 has brought uh, an unveiling of a new era. And I think anywhere you go in this country, you find people, and they know something is dreadfully wrong with this society now. They know it. And they can't all put their finger on it. Well, I will tell you what is wrong. And the thing is that we're driving this car. Or we thought we're driving this car. But someone else is controlling the steering. Okay, and that's what it is. We've lost control over our government. That's what it is. And what has happened is we've developed secrecy as a way of life in this society. And it, it you know, evolved over the last few generations. This is, this is a very, very, very bare bones, you know, mind control experiments. We had in, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, beyond, and to this day, there's no question about this, but we know for a fact that horrific, grisly uh, experiments on the human mind were done on behalf of CIA and other agencies, Navy, all right? The worst of them were done off American soil for deniability. And I'm talking about like terminal experiments and irreversible scrambling of people's brains, uh, sensory deprivation, I mean, horrific things. How do we know about mind control experiments, by the way? I'll tell you. A roll of the dice could just as easily have been that we wouldn't know about it. In 72, when Rick Nixon got reelected, he, he, uh, he, he didn't like Richard Helms, who ran the CIA, so he fired him. He said, you have a month to clear out your desk. And Helms, Helms knew everything at the CIA. And he went, oh my gosh. So he went to Sid Gottlieb, who ran the mind control programs, and he said, you've got to get rid of everything. Get rid of everything here. And Gottlieb did his best, but he couldn't do everything. He didn't have enough time. And a couple of years later, a researcher found some documents pertaining to MK Ultra, and started putting two and two together. And that is how you know about this program. And if, if Gottlieb had more time to dispose of those records, all we would have regarding mind control experiments is rumor. Bacteriological weapon testing in American cities, again, during the 50s and 60s in particular, conveniently in American ghettos primarily, People died as a result of those tests. We know it happened. And by that meaning, essentially no one knows it happened, but you can know it happened because you can find books on it by academics. The plutonium testing, right? Where I live in Rochester, New York, they did, they did a, quite a bit of this in the 40s. The uh, wonderful Tuskegee uh, experiments where black men were allowed to live with syphilis their entire lives because it was interesting to observe. And then we have... And by the way, all of those things, I mean, we, we learn about through the efforts of a few dedicated investigators who just as easily could have uh, not gotten this information. We've had, even, even on a broader scale, though, institutional secrecy. Uh, in 1952, the National Security Agency was founded, okay, the NSA. And it's important to emphasize that the NSA was the most powerful as far as we know, intelligence agency in the U.S. government system, and it was totally unknown for over a decade. No one knew, not even Congress members, most, most members of Congress had no idea that this thing existed. And it was bigger than the CIA. It was a black arm of government that was bigger than anything else and totally unacknowledged. Think about that, all right? Same with the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, founded around 1960, which was a felony to mention the existence of that organization until the 90s. 
in Congress. You could not mention it. 30 years. Unbelievable. The NRO is uh, formally charged with monitoring our spy satellites, right? Well, there's certainly very significant UFO connections with the NRO. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you ask today, well, why are there any other secret organizations today? Or are you going to pull a CIA and say something like, well, you know, we did that in the past, but now we don't do that anymore, which is what you know, people say. Well, no, of course not. That's ridiculous. I, I spoke with a, um, a, a military attache who lives in this area, good guy. And, you know, he tells me, the scuttlebutt, he has a friend who's a senior congressional aide who did some budget research and analysis and came to the conclusion after crunching numbers, this is years ago, that there had to be an enormous, what he called, black arm of government. So, you know, secret that it was, didn't, didn't supposedly exist, that involved a tremendous amount of money. And this aide apparently came to the conclusion, according to my friend, that that arm of government was related to the topic of UFOs. Why would that shock anyone? Now we come to the, to the I know Steve hates the phrase UFO, but I'm, I'm using it, sorry, forgive me. We come to UFOs now. And let's segue and, and slide this into the mix. Here's a few things we know. We have to remember what we know. Always distinguish what you know from what you think you know. And in this field, we all think we know certain things, and they may end up being true, in fact. But I, uh, you know, I still try to tread as cautiously as I can. And that doesn't mean that I deny uh, certain you know, very bizarre stories. In fact, I know some of these are probably true. But we have to remember what we know, always distinguishing. Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. What did, what did he mean by that? He, that was his way of starting a new philosophy of uh, absolute foundation of knowledge that could not be denied upon which he tried to build a, a new edifice of knowledge. And I think we, we should remember this type of thing. Remember what you know. Remember what you don't exactly know, OK? What you think you know. What we know is that this phenomenon is real. It's real. No matter who it is, no matter where it's from, it's real. It involves real technology, real technology that is not supposed to exist. We know that. We know that the secrecy is real. What we also know we need to remind ourselves of is this. There is a lot of money involved in this topic. None of us are getting it, but it is there because it involves the most advanced technology in this world. How can it not involve an enormous amount of money? There are also many potential dangers associated with this topic. There is, of course, the oft-discussed possibility that they are here to kind of rub us out develop a hybrid race and uh, replace us, and, or, or other, other major dangers involved. When you start studying this topic, I mean, you become aware of some serious crises that this planet is about to embark upon and, and meet. And so we know about all of this. And the real problem is that there's no public oversight of it. You and I do not have the <laughs> right well, we do have the right, but we don't have the right to look into this. All right? People, the people are blocked again and again at attaining some level of knowledge, and it is through knowledge that you have control. So let's think about a few questions as we continue along here. Some people really think, you know, why does the secrecy even matter? Who cares? I work. I got to, you know, crack my nut each week, make the money, pay the bills, raise the kids. Got to get my TV time in. How, how, you know, why should I care about this? Well, there are many reasons to care. Here's one. This is an idealistic answer, but let's remember. Because you cannot have an open society. You cannot have a free society if you have a society based on secrecy. It's an obvious statement, and we have to remind ourselves of it. What does it mean about your society when something this big has been denied for six decades? That's another question to ponder. Can you really say you have a free society when something this massive is denied to you for so long? You know, freedom is all relative. We're free compared with other people in other situations. But are we, is, are we as free as we think we are? By the way, the other reason secrecy matters is because there's, 
As I just said a moment ago, there's money and technology involved. And you're paying for it, guys. <laughs> we pay for it. Now, I don't want to go through all this history in uh, great detail. I did some of this yesterday. And it is not for me to, uh, I don't want to belabor things today. What I want to stay here, say in this case is that the secrecy of, of this topic goes back. I'm not giving an analysis of what I think these were today. Uh, what I am going to say is that you try to find out what official conclusions were on these events, and you can't get those conclusions. We're talking 60 years ago. What were these things? In the case of Foo Fighters over uh, in World War II, we know that at least three major intelligence agencies looked into it, American and British, probably more. What were their conclusions? Gosh, we don't know. We don't have concluding statements on them. We know they looked into it. Now, you know, in World War II, that's a big thing. A lot of things can get lost in World War II. I, I can appreciate that. But still, we can't find out. We have Roswell and everything associated with that. Again, <clears throat> my point here with Roswell is that by the end of World War II, we had major secrecy protocols well established within the society. But yet Roswell got out, right, for three hours in July of 1947. The world was being told that the, that the U.S. Army had in its possession one of those flying saucers. Of course, we know that Jesse Marcel, an intelligence officer, was fooled by a balloon. He couldn't tell that it was a balloon, right? No, wrong. The problem was that the story got out. And if you are one of these elite people charged with managing this secret, and I'll tell, let's talk in a moment why it would be secret. You have to silence this story. It must be silenced. Even within the three hours, I mean, all hell broke loose at Roswell. Phones would go off the hook from around the world. People fascinated by this. And this is what you would not want. I mean, put yourself in the position of, of Harry Truman or some other big shot <clears throat> who might be responsible for this flying saucer business. I mean, well, assume for the moment that Roswell was what many people think was the acquisition of a, a non human technology. And if not Roswell, there were others. Um, there's no question about this in my mind. But you'd have a lot of things to worry about. You'd have the Soviets to worry about, certainly. Soviet spies were, were all throughout the US intelligence and scientific community in 1947. They were trying to get the secret to the bomb, the atomic bomb, which they would get and would detonate one of their own in a couple of years. So you got that. You've got, uh, to some extent, I think legitimately, a fear of public panic. I don't know if that's the determining factor today. In fact, I don't think it is. But I think in, in 47, it might have been on the minds of some responsible people thinking, OK, wait, let's think about this, how we're going to tell the public. Let's hold on. But then you've got the other thing, which is uh, I call the lure of power. Because you've got this technology, see? And it's really, really amazing. And you think, wow, I can do a lot of things with this. We can study it. So what would you do if you, Truman, I think, would you keep it secret? I think you just might. You're certainly not willing to share atomic technology with the world. Why would you share this? I don't think so. I think what you would do is you'd keep it so secret, you'd have to hide it from yourself. And I think that's what they did. You get a, a team of ultra reliable, brilliant scientists, and you'd say, let's figure this out. Find out what we can do with this. And who are these beings? And so on and on and on. The very logical questions you would ask, I think, is what would, were done. You could have justifications in your mind for doing this, or maybe not so justified. And the thing is, we don't know, do we? Because we don't have the, <laughs> the full story, uh, at least officially we don't. The question is, how long is secrecy justified? That's the question. Is it justified for 60 years? I don't think so. Now, this is a no-brainer. How do we know UFOs are serious? Well, here's a couple of reasons. The documents prove it. The tone of these documents is serious. The content matter is serious. The implications are obvious. And it's worth bearing in mind, for 30 years, from the 1940s up until the late 70s, it was relatively easy for government agencies to say they don't know anything about UFOs. Because the Freedom of Information Act did not have the teeth uh, to allow researchers to try to yank some of those documents out of the government. In the late 1970s, that changed. And Although it is fair to say that there is not a single smoking gun among those FOIA documents that proves the matter once and for all. There's no confirmed FOIA document that's a memo 
from the president, a confirmed FOIA document that says, you know, what are we going to do about these pesky aliens? But there are a number of documents that are one cut below this. They are freely available in the public domain, and there is no argument over their authenticity that state astonishing military encounters with objects that are obviously technological and that had no business doing what they did in, in acting provocative ways, confrontational ways, over to restrict their space, and on and on. Now, this is a famous memo. I'm not going to give a big dissertation on the Twining memo, but I want to point out that, that Nathan Twining in September 1947 wrote about this topic to General Charles Shulgin. And let us just remind ourselves that Twining, who later became chief of uh, uh, staff of the US Air Force, and you know you can count the stars there. I think he became a four star, said that this phenomenon is real. It's real. It's not visionary. It's not fictitious. And then this memo that he, he wrote, which was secret for 20 years, uh, in astonishing detail describes this phenomenon as far as the military reports that were coming in, describing incredible maneuverability, evasive when sighted. And then here, this is the one that still gets me every time, circular or elliptical in shape, flat on bottom and domed on top. 1947, OK? Now, <clears throat> the thing about the Twining Memo that I want to mention is that this document was classified secret. That is, it was not classified top secret. You may think, well, big deal. Who cares? Well, this is why it matters. Because you know, when, you, when you look at these documents, it's like an archaeological dig, and there are different lev levels of secrecy. If this document is secret, that means he cannot, by definition, be allowed to mention a matter that is top secret. Keep that in mind. Okay, that's not, you can't do that. You break protocol. I'll bring you the, uh, the, imp the real important that in a moment. The significance of it. Regarding Roswell, you have skeptics who take the Twining memo and they say, aha, uh -huh, well, he mentioned in the memo, didn't he, that we hadn't recovered any records, right? So that proves Roswell didn't happen. Wrong. It doesn't prove that at all. Because if the recipient of this did not have a need to know, um, he, he couldn't mention it. I mean, you just can't do that. And besides, the, the classification of the document is only secret. And, and I mention this because the topic of flying saucers, we know for a fact, was considered top secret. This is a, a memo from January 1949 from Strategic Air Command to the FBI. How much more obviously needed to, to be stated? This matter is considered top secret by intelligence officers of both the Army and the Air Force. So, and yet of all the Freedom of Information Act requests and documents that have come down, we've, only the tiniest handful of documents were top secret, and most of them were heavily blacked out. So the vast majority are either secret or even lower, restricted, confidential, and so forth, that are um, certainly important to have. But the point of an archaeological dig is that they're not the deepest layers. Now, if you speak to Dr. Uh, Bob Wood and Ryan Wood, they, they have gotten a, um, a large cache of documents that um, look like the real McCoy, and I believe uh, a number of these are. The, the only problem is that it, they have to fight on the authenticity with a, a very skeptical public that says, well, you know, the providence of these is questionable and so on. So it's a tough fight, and they're fighting the good fight on this. Uh, from the point of view of the FOIA documents, so you don't have to go through that because they are officially released. And even from these documents, which is not as deep a level, archaeologically speaking, you can get a lot of information out of it. Uh, I'm not going to do a document hunt here for you today. I'm just going to look at one or two others here. But I think this is a significant one, also from 1949, the same day, in fact, as the one I just showed you, describing sightings over Kirtland Air Force Base. Local commanders perturbed by implications of phenomena. OK, yeah, I think you would be. Uh, this is a nice, a great photograph, of course, from McMinnville, Oregon, by the Trent, Paul Trent. This has been analyzed by many, many people, and it's authentic, as far as anyone can tell. It's absolutely, no one's debunked this. I mention it because, uh, let's, let's move on now, because now we're getting into the meat of why I think we've got the secrecy and why the secrecy is, has transformed our society. This is a memo from 1950. You know, I first read this. I don't know what to do with this. I, don't think, I really think a lot of people don't know what to do with this memo because it's like right there in your face. It's an official Freedom of Information Act document, and it describes 
And an Air Force investigator states that these so three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall. It's a 1950 memo. People have looked at this and, and then really with very minimal content. Now this, in fairness, does not prove that this is true. It simply states that an Air Force investigator said this. And so it's a secondhand thing, but nevertheless, nevertheless. Well, I want to talk about uh, crash retrievals a bit. <clears throat> Wilbert Smith is a man who uh, many of us know about, but he gets, he gets a little bit left behind, I think, in some of these stories. And he was a Canadian uh, government official, uh, a man who was fascinated by this topic. And in 1950, uh, in Washington, talking privately to some, some heavy hitters. And, and he wrote this memo to his government at the end of 1950, and he said, I made discreet inquiries through the Canadian embassy staff in Washington who, who learned this for me. The matter, and he's talking about UFOs, is the most highly classified subject in the United States, rating higher even than the H-bomb. And the hydrogen bomb was just being developed at that time. Flying saucers exist. Their modus operandi is unknown. How do they work? We don't know. But concentrated effort is being made by a small group of scientists headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush, the same Vannevar Bush, of course, who's listed in the MJ-12 documents as uh, one of the original MJ-12 members. And Vannevar Bush was, without question, America's leading, let's call him, power scientist. Scientists who had the top, best national security connections probably ever, uh, at the time, anyway. And then finally, the entire matter is considered by the US authorities to be of tremendous significance, obviously. This, this uh, document here is a uh, handwritten statement, handwritten notes by Wilbert Smith found in his, uh, in his papers after his death. It's a conversation that he wrote down with a scientist, Dr. Robert Sarbacher. In a 1983, uh, long after Smith had died, Sarbacher was still alive and a uh, UFO researcher, William Steinman, said, hey, you know what, let's go find Sarbacher. I'm gonna ask him about this. So he found him, corresponded with him. Sarbacher, <laughs> Sarbacher confirmed, this is Sarbacher's letter here, you can just see that it exists. He said, John von Neu Neumann was involved, Dr. Vannevar Bush was definitely involved, and I think Dr. Robert Oppenheimer also. About the only thing I remember at this time, <laughs> the only thing I remember at this time, doesn't that remind you of like Iran-Contra? That's all I remember at this time, is that certain materials reported to have come from flying saucer crashes were extremely light and very tough. I am sure our laboratories analyzed them very carefully. There were reports that instruments or people operating these machines were also of very light weight. <laughs> I remember in talking with some of the people at the office that I got the impression these aliens were constructed like certain insects. Sabaka said this in 1983. He died shortly after that. So think about the, now this is a, a significant because Wilbur Smith's revelations are a big deal. They, his statements were confirmed by the guy who could confirm it the best, and that's Sarbacher himself. Absolutely. It confirms also that this topic is important and probably expensive and that it is beyond your control. There is no question that the public record, again, documents that are not, you can't argue them, prove that military and the intel crowd want this technology. The Air Force uh, Manual, AFR 200-2 from 1954, states it matter-of-factly. Interest in this topic is twofold. First, as a possible threat to security. Second, to determine the technical aspects involved. And that manual also stated that the Air Force should only release information on objects that were positively identified as a familiar object. In 1954, they don't want you to know about it, in other words. We have the, uh, a fairly well-known memo from 1959, UFOs are serious business. This was sent from the Air Force Inspector General to the base commanders in 1959, and mentions that technical and defense considerations continue to exist in this area. 
We have statements from a few very important people that they take this topic seriously. Alan Dulles, who ran CIA, as CIA director at the time in 1955, made a statement that said maximum security exists concerning the subject of UFOs. Said this in a letter privately. Why would Alan Dulles say that? Especially in 1955 when you've got the government telling you a totally different thing. I'll mention some of those statements in just a moment. You have Roscoe Hillencoder from 1960. After he had already been CIA director, Hillencoder ran CIA from 47 to 50. And Hillencoder, here's something that, um, where are the you know, naval historians and CIA historians here? Why did Hillencoder join NICAP, the leading civilian UFO anti-secrecy organization in the world in the 1950s, and was a board member right up until 1962? He says, Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are sober, soberly concerned about UFOs. And Hillencoder, by the way, was, uh, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Just hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Bodies and technology. We all know who Edgar Mitchell is. Uh, <clears throat> Edgar Mitchell, for the last couple of years, has been very public about a certain statement. He said this last year. This is him a year ago in uh, New Mexico. He said, I have two sources, elite level. He won't say who they are. That's his prerogative, we understand. Who have confirmed to me the existence of deep black programs charged with analyzing alien technology and bodies. You think about this, all right? You're Apollo 14. Who, who would not want to talk to Edgar Mitchell? You know, if he wants to talk to someone, they're going to talk to him, <laughs> I would think. It's about as prominent as you get. So his friends are very, very elite. And this is what they said to him, and he's willing to say this publicly. That, to me, is astonishing. That's like if Neil Armstrong were to say it, because it's the same thing. All right? Whatever your position on the moon landing, by the way, that's irrelevant. His public position is such that to make this statement is a big, big deal. Where is the media? There was one article on, on his statement about a year ago that just ups, absolutely uh, trivialized the whole thing. And then that was it, just buried it. Well, I think, I think the statement deserves a little bit more attention than that. Uh, and what Dr. Mitchell says it accords fully with the research of uh, Leonard Stringfield, the uh, UFO researcher who in the late 1970s collected stories, reports, accounts from dozens of people, about 30 or so firsthand accounts and about 30 or more <clears throat> secondhand accounts because the original person either was dead or, or was afraid to meet with him personally went through an intermediary, who told him various accounts of uh, either the, the uh, retrieval of, of uh, alien technology or the uh, storage of alien bodies, typically in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at the Blue Room at Hangar 18. Stringfield was himself a World War II veteran and a very low-key, meticulous man who I think was able to get these stories, frankly, because the people who went to him trusted him and uh, toward the later part of his life was really preoccupied with relaying these accounts in a safe way for the witnesses, but in a manner so as to get this information out. And uh, there is a lot of it. So this is what it looks like. It looks like alien bodies and technology are being studied in great secrecy. That's what it looks like. And again, to many of you who are sitting here, that's like, well, you know, tell me something I don't know. Okay, fair enough. But we all have to remember in this field that we are like those shining points of light, well, there's a lot of darkness around us. And there are many people in this world who are not aware of this stuff, or they think it's all nonsense. And one of the things that we need to take away from us today is, is to have the courage, you know, the intellectual courage and the physical courage to not, not to be afraid to uh, either first learn the truth and then to speak the truth. That's what we have to do. What does this mean to you? that this is being done. There are political implications, obviously. There's, there's the implication of the fact that this program is so important and you can't control it, you can't know about it. It's gone for over 50 years, and why can't you know about it? Because someone's hoarding it, maybe. There are fiscal implications. There must be, oh, simply because there must be. You know, uh, 15 years ago, journalist Tim Weiner wrote a book called The Black Budget, back around 1990. 
And it, it was a good book. He estimated back then that the black budget, that is the unofficial amount of money being spent, secret, unacknowledged, was about $30 billion. Even then, that was almost certainly low. And today, it's, it's probably not even, not even close as to what the black budget actually is. There are technological implications. Look, we're, we're burning away these fossil fuels, doing some obvious, we all know this, horrible things to this planet. How long are we going to be able to do this? You know, this, we didn't evolve in the concrete jungle in which we live. We evolved in a real jungle, which we've essentially, in many places, obliterated. And we're doing all these other things. I don't know what it's going to be that's going to send us into a cascade eco ecosystem failure. But I do know that we are at the top of that food chain. And we have relied, this globe relies on a very delicate interlocking of a lot of factors that we're still not smart enough to control. And so that something really bad can happen. And one of these is being caused, of course, we all know this, by the continual combustion of fossil fuels. Well, with the UFO phenomenon, sure looks like they got some other way of moving around. And it doesn't rely on 100 octane uh, gasoline. And we need to know about it. And yet throughout all of these years, we have a party line. And this is the party line. And it has not wavered in 50 plus years. Back in 1949, the Air Force was talking about the same stuff over and over. Well, UFOs, all of this stuff are misinterpretations of things that are ordinary. Mass hysteria, war nerves. I still don't know what war nerves for the, for the population would be. What is it? Hoaxers, right, and, and psychopathological persons. And then on and on. You get the statements through the years. Eisenhower made such a statement uh, in 1954 basically working off what the Air Force had said a few months earlier, no flying saucers except in the imagination of those who see them. Edward Condon, who ran the Colorado Project. To this day, as a result of Condon, of course, the, uh, and the conclusions of the Colorado Project in the 1960s, the Air Force says, well, you know, we don't do UFOs anymore. We're done. We're out. And so if you inquire, you, you will still get the standard form letter. From 1949, we investigated, and all in very, you know, bureaucratic language. The conclusions of the project were no UFO reported, investigated, or evaluated by the Air Force was ever an indication or threat of threat to our national security. I just showed you a couple of documents earlier, no, only a few, that clearly proved the lie to that statement. There are many more. No evidence that these represent technological developments beyond our current knowledge. No evidence that they were extraterrestrial. And since we've ended Blue Book, nothing has occurred that would support a resumption of UFO investigations by the Air Force. All of these statements are lies, every one of them, every one. Um, no UFO reported and investigated was an indication of threat to our national security. Wow. Well, throughout, I don't know how much time I have because we started late. I'm just going to keep going. I have a lot more to talk about. We have, um, you know, despite the evolution of our society toward a kind of invisible fascism, people still think they live in a free country. And so throughout these times, people have attempted periodically to get information out of this. Phase one was in the 1950s and 60s through NICAP. And that's Donald Kehoe who ran NICAP. His face is scrunched in a little bit, but that's him. And what happened was this. NICAP was founded. and. You know, they came out like a bat out of hell and, and established relationships with members of Congress right away. And Kehoe was, was tireless, and he um, kept trying to get congressional hearings on this topic every year. And every, every year it seemed at the 11th hour something would go wrong, and a congressman would say, well, all right, sorry, not this year, but we're going to do it next year. We're really going to try to gather enough momentum, and we'll make it happen so we can have open hearings on UFOs. We'll do it. And, and it didn't happen. And in fact, I mentioned Roscoe Hillencoder a moment ago. Hillencoder was a NICAP board member and a friend of Kehoe's. And the thing was this. In 1962, they were planning. This was going to be the moment. We're going to get Hillencoder in front of Congress, and he's going to talk publicly about this. You know, you can't get someone more respected than that. He ran the CIA. He's, he's, a, um, he's a player. Two months before this, Hillencoder wrote a note to Kehoe saying, uh, well, uh, look, I think we should get off the backs of the Air Force of doing everything they can do. And by the way, I, I hereby resign my membership as a board member of NICAP. And that was the end of Hill and Coder. 
someone got to him. You have the crisis of 1966, however. What happened? Well, whoever's behind this phenomenon doesn't really seem to care what the Air Force says about them or the CIA. So they, we had a massive wave of sightings in the mid-60s. And this was a big deal because Congress got involved. You had members of Congress saying, my constituents want to know what's happening. And you know what? I, I'd like to know, too. And so the thing that the Air Force and the CIA and other managers dreaded was in danger of happening, which was that the old government, the old republic, Congress, threatened to get involved in this business, OK? And not the national security state, which was managing this. Because what we had going on is, is basically a war between those two, those two governments, the old government and the new one, the government of the republic and the government of empire. And we have that today. And, and basically, it's the fights, you know. This is like we're in the 13th round, and the republic's getting pummeled. <laughs> but maybe the bell hasn't rung. Anyway, so in 1966, what the Air Force did was, was brilliant, I think. Uh, rather than lose control of this problem that was spiraling, threatening to spiral out of their control, they regained the initiative, like a chess player who made that great move to regain the initiative in the attack. And what they did was they, on their own, uh, just found the University of Colorado. They picked, they selected the University of Colorado. They knew what they were getting. And they said, OK, here's what we'll do. We're going to have this scientific study done. We're going to pay for it, but they're going to do their thing. And whatever, they, whatever Colorado comes to, we're going to abide by that answer. Oh, this, by the way, is Alan Hynek in 1966 discussing the uh, event that became known as Michigan Swamp Gas, unfortunately, for Hynek. That was really the low point of the Air Force's credibility, and, and Hynek's as well, in fact. But as a result of that, the Air Force got, got in gear and got this happening. And so what you had was the Condon Committee, Edward Condon, who was obviously hostile to UFOs from the get-go. Well, everyone knew this. Uh, in fact, said to one of the members on the committee privately, well, if we actually come in, to an affirmative conclusion on this, I'm, taking, I'm, I'm sealing the, the data into a suitcase, and I'm taking it directly to the president. So he actually said that if, no matter what it was, the public wasn't going to get an affirmative conclusion on this. So what happened as a result was that Blue Book closed. All right? Now, Project Blue Book, we all know it was a joke. All right? It was a public relations desk charged with explaining a way to the public. This, but, but it's still significant that Blue Book closed because as bad as it was, it was still yours. And it was still your tool to use as a crowbar to kind of pry this open. And that tool was taken away from you in 1969. So that now, you know, in, in 1960, you didn't have to believe in little green men or little gray men to see if you saw a odd thing in the sky, you would still do your patriotic duty, you thought, and report this to your local Air Force base, and it would go to Blue Book. And you could personally have some closure on the issue. You can't do that now. Now you see something like this, where do you go? You have nowhere to go. So, so your government is that much less responsive to you as a result of this. And by the way, it's important to mention there was a memo from 1969 by a general which stated the reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with JANAP 146, an important uh, uh, document, or Air Force Manual 5511, and are not part of the Blue Book system. All right? a, a bold statement, a naked statement, basically telling you that Blue Book, yeah, you know, didn't have the national security implications anyway. So thus, as I've just said, UFOs are removed from the realm of public government interaction. This is a political decision. This is not a scientific decision. It's a political decision. The people shut out, phase two, I call the FOIA crisis of the late 1970s. Why? Well, because just when you thought this matter was being put to sleep, the freedom, we had Watergate, we had the end of Vietnam, and we had a mood in this country in the mid-70s that was very different than that that we've ever had before or since. I was a young boy in the early 70s, and I grew up in the 70s, and I remember this very well. It was my formative period, you could say. Uh, I wasn't involved in this field at all. But what happened was, once the freedom of information I got its teeth in the mid-70s, a number of dedicated UFO researchers, some of whom are here today, petitioned the government and various agencies for these documents. And, and this is when you get the situation of years and years and years of denial where suddenly proven to be a lie. The CIA had thousands of pages of documents on this, and probably much more. 
NSA, an extended court battle to get NSA documents out in which every <laughs> document was, the, the affidavit, the, uh, the judge decision which said why the documents couldn't be released was itself classified and almost entirely blacked out. I mean, an unbelievable thing. So it was possible for a researcher in the late 70s and, and the, maybe the very early 80s to think, okay, all right, this could be, this could be the thing that cracks it open. Freedom of Information Act is going to be the tool to bust this whole thing open. And the mood was very distinctive. You, uh, you know, go through the old uh, uh, journals and documents, and you can see that researchers, understandably, were excited about this, but it didn't happen. And what happened, actually, is that uh, the Freedom of Information Act had its own ups and downs. I think a significant event was in 1982, an executive order that uh, didn't overturn the FOIA, that's a little bit too dramatic, but weakened it significantly, made it much less user-friendly. Under Carter, the, the thing about Jimmy Carter was that he intentionally promoted a liberal interpretation of FOIA and told federal agencies, you have to respond quickly and you can't give people a hard time, you can't charge them an arm and a leg. You can just do it, all right? I don't want you to give away all the detailed national security secrets, but you have to be reasonable. And that attitude never made it easy. I mean, there was still obfuscation and obstruction, but it was at least more possible then than at other periods to get some of this key information. And indeed, some, most of the best documents that we've received officially through FOIA were obtained during that period. The act was, in the opinions of some researchers, gutted in 82. Uh, basically, the Democratic presidents, Clinton and Carter, were more FOIA-friendly than the Republican ones. I'm not making a blanket value statement, but it's a fact. The act is at uh, a low point now. It doesn't mean that we can't do archival research. There are excellent archival researchers in the field today, and they are continuing to get information out. So it's not, you know, we're not an end game here. But what I'm saying is that this act has had its ups and downs. And, and it, is true that, it is true that NORAD, for example, which evidence is now pointing to NORAD as an absolutely key conduit of UFO data, NORAD is exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. They do not have to answer a single FOIA request. People shut out phase three. I call it phase three. The Roswell crisis of the early 90s. This whole thing was dead, right, after 1947? Well, it wasn't dead. Stanton Friedman, Kevin Randall, and other people started interviewing these Roswell witnesses in the 1980s and started putting a heck of a story together. And by around 1990, the uh, plan was, through the Fund for UFO Research and uh, involved people, to get a video compilation of all the Roswell witnesses and to show this to members of Congress. Wow, that would be something, wouldn't it? Well. Yeah, I should have had that up there. Well, what happened? So uh, eventually this gets in front of New Mexico Representative Stephen Schiff. Uh, and he says, you know, this, this is very interesting indeed. And Schiff came about this in a very, uh, very responsible and intelligent way. He didn't say, I believe in flying saucers. He said, look, I want to know what happened, okay? My constituents want to know. I'd like to know. And let's find out. So what did he do? Well, he talked to the Pentagon. Pentagon liaisons who absolutely stonewalled him and brushed him off, annoyed him. And he said, well, I'm a member of the uh, oversight of the General Accounting Office Committee. That's our, the Congress's investigative arm. I'm going to ask them to look into this. And, and the GAO said, you know what? Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Let's do it. Let's go for it. And the GAO started to look into this. And again, the Air Force acted, exactly analogous to how it acted on, in the 1960s. The Air Force, on its own initiative, started to uh, gather its own Roswell story and was able, before the GAO finished their report, to tell you that, well, actually, Roswell wasn't just an ordinary weather balloon. It was a, a classified balloon project known as Mogul and so on. So they beat the GAO to the punch. That was the key. And they, they made their point. They won their point. And the GAO, by the way, uh, said when they finally got their report out, well, it was really difficult because all the records we were trying to look at seemed to be gone, and there was no reason why they were gone. They shouldn't have been gone, and there was no <laughs> explanation given. Roswell Army Airfield, in other words, from uh, the end of 1946 to the early 47, I, we couldn't get anything. <laughs> That's what they said. The people shut out again. Senator Goldwater. All right? Barry Goldwater ran for president in 1964. He was a general in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. He was friends with Curtis LeMay. 
Gary Goldwater was rebuffed repeatedly in his attempt, as he said, to gain access to the so-called Blue Room at Wright-Patterson Wright Air Force Base. He wrote a number of letters on this. This is one of them here from 1981. And he said, this thing has gotten so highly classified, even though I will admit there is a lot of it that has been released. He's speaking of the, uh, the Freedom of Information Act era of the late 70s. It is just impossible to get anything on it. Even then, he could see. OK? I mentioned I had this slide on my talk yesterday, but I had to kind of rush through it, so I'm, I'm bringing it up here again. Significant. Ben Rich, we need to know more about this man and his statements. Ben Rich succeeded Kelly Johnson as the head of Lockheed's elite division known as Skunk Works. Toward the end of his life, Ben Rich talked a little bit about UFOs. He said, yeah, well, I you know, knew Kelly Johnson quite well. And we had a couple of discussions, not many, but a few on, on the topic of UFOs. Turns out Kelly Johnson was very interested in UFOs. A fact, unfortunately, I did not know when I wrote my book. I will work that into the next book, though, somehow. But he said that Kelly Johnson said to him, there are two types of UFOs, ours and theirs. So we've you know, got some of their stuff, and we've been working on our own technology. Uh, he said around 1969, control over this program went away from the US presidency to a private international group. He said quasi-public, quasi-private. He said uh, that it was Johnson's opinion, Kelly Johnson's opinion, that the aliens seemed to be more of a threat than a blessing, and that the public should not be told about it. However, Rich said that toward the end of Kelly Johnson's life, Kelly Johnson believed that the human directors dealing with the subject may be more of a threat to our freedom than the aliens themselves. Yeah. And Kelly Johnson, you know, I, I bet if you go through the aerospace community and you want to find like the single most classic legend, I bet he would be it. And then uh, in 1993, Ben Rich spoke at the UCLA School of Engineering alumni group, gave a long speech on the history of Skunk Works, and he ended it with that amazing statement. <laughs> we now have the technology to take ET home. That was what he ended it on. End on a high note, as George Costanza used to say. Well, he did, but of course, the people in the audience didn't want to leave it at that, so they kind of surrounded him afterward and discussed with him. And one of the people there is an executive who, uh, who repeated this. And actually, it seemed to be verbatim. Rich said, we now know how to travel to the stars, 1993. He said, there is an error in the equations, and we have figured it out. And we now know how to travel to the stars, and it won't take a lifetime to do it. He said, it is time to end all the secrecy on this, as it no longer poses a national security threat, and make the technology available for use in the private sector. And the last, this is a paraphrase, apparently, of what Rich said. There are many in the intelligence community who would like to see this stay in the black and not see the light of day. Yeah. So aliens, sure. But it's also about money. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was speaking uh, across the country at another of these conferences, and a, uh, uh, one of the organizers came up to me in a state of panic. And he said, Rich. Um, I'm not going to mention the name. So-and-so uh, wants to talk to you. And so-and-so and -so is this scary guy who had a deep black ops history, apparently, and people were afraid of this man. And I didn't know much about him. He came up to me, and I finally met with him. And uh, actually, he offered me inside information about purloined technology from Area 51 in, re in response uh, in return, I would have to sign a non-disclosure agreement and not reveal any of this stuff. And I said, well, you know, no thanks. Look, the guy wasn't going to tell me anything that I probably don't already know. And, and uh, to tie my hands like that, there's just, there's no way I would ever do that. But one thing he said to me, and he's standing there, and he says, you know, he was a tough guy. You could tell. He said, you know what they're guarding out there at Area 51? They're guarding money, <laughs> trillions of dollars worth of money. He did sound a little bit like George C. Scott. <laughs> and uh, I think his point was a good one. He said, this stuff is so valuable. It's so valuable. They just, there's, no, there's no incentive for these people to give this up. Why? Why would they possibly share it with you? I mean, think about it. If you're a scientist and you're charged 
you know, with figuring this stuff out, all right, and you, so you're, you're a genius and you're banging your head against the wall for five, 10 years, whatever. Then you have a eureka moment and you think, oh yeah, wow, we can, we can do this. So you, you know, you've got a great ground floor investment opportunity among many other things. I don't see the, I don't see the um, incentive for, for giving this up. Especially now, if, if as Rich has indicated and others certainly um, corroborate, that control over this is really beyond uh, you know, official government power. Can someone tell me how much time I have in this? Is it possible to know? Well, you know, you're, you're, you're just about done now. You can probably get three minutes out of it. OK, well, thanks. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> so that's what we've got. You know, who, who controls this program? How big is this program? Well, it looks like it's really big. It looks very, very big. How much of your money supports it? I don't know. Lots. I mean, think about this. The US official military budget is $420 billion now. So we have a population of, I think, 280 mil, million people. So you do, just do the math on that. That's $1,500 for every man, woman, and child in this country. You have a family of four, that's $6,000. Now, I don't know if 6,000 of your dollars are paying. Of course, it's all on credit. It's all going to wreck the dollar once China floods the market with their dollars. The, the thing is, though, that we're talking an enormous amount of money here. It's a public issue, guys. We have to get control over it. What have they learned from this technology? There's some questions. Have they learned what biological information, what genetic information have they learned from studying bodies? Have they learned how to retard the aging process, to end the aging process? Have they learned other things? This, you know, 20, 30 years ago, this would be like total science fantasy, but we all know that it isn't, all right? We all know that it isn't fantasy any longer. Money plus secrecy equals power. And your official society tells you you're in a free society, but no society is like this. All societies are hierarchical, all right? It's just the myths that, that the societies give you that, that vary. Do they have the right to have secrecy? I, I've done some radio interviews every now and then. I get really distressed over people who call in. And they'll say, well, you know, look, the public just can't handle this, man. They're going to freak out. I'm like, what are you, like a little five-year-old? <laughs> what, what, what is it with you? You have no guts? You're going to be like a little peasant sitting on, sitting on your ass saying, oh, I'm going to wait. I'll wait for Big Brother to tell me when, it's my, when they think I should know. This is how people are. And I, I don't, it's distressing to encounter this, but I know that there are people like us who don't believe this. And so it is our job to, to, to tell them. That, yeah, the guys who have control over this, they want the right to keep this secret. Of course they do, and they'll come up with any rationalization possible. Because people have an infinite capacity to rationalize anything they want, depending on who's signing their paycheck. That's, that's what we do. Is this truly a public policy issue? In the sense, are they really worried about you jumping out of a building and freaking out? I don't think they care about that, all right? They don't care about that. What they care about is, are you gonna, is this going to rock the boat sufficiently that our situation is going to be threatened? Do you have the right to know? Forget does the public have the right to know. Do you have the right to know? Yes. Damn right. You do have the right to know. <laughs> Forget these people, the people, my next door neighbor can't handle it. I don't care about your next door neighbor. Do you have the right to know? Can you handle it? You can handle it. It's about citizenship, all right? It's about a lot of things. This topic is so big, it's so immense. But one thing it's about is you. And your status as a human being, I'm not talking about your status in the Intergalactic Federation. And I'm not maligning exopolitics. But what I'm saying is that I'm talking about these politics here in this society. You have a right to be an active citizen in a democratic republic that you're supposed to be living in. This is my last slide. I'll, let's wrap it up. How can disclosure occur? I believe disclosure will only result in revolutionary activity. I, I do not believe any longer that disclosure can be done peacefully. But that's not a reason not to do it, guys. I mean, look, the president says, well, OK, aliens are real. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Going on vacation. No, you've got everything opens up now. Everything opens up, and everything becomes up for grabs. The whole abduction phenomena becomes serious. The, all the questions about underground alien bases become legitimate. All the issues about reverse engineered technology are right on the table. 
And suddenly, as Ricky said to Lucy, you've got a lot of splaining to do. <laughs> and, and it will happen that this society, which has had secrecy, which has subverted our official Republican form of government, all, right, all of this is going to come out. If not within the first five minutes, not in the first five days, it'll come out within five years. No way, it can't. And so by that time, you can't, no one can predict the outcome of such a spinning of out of control of this stuff. But <clears throat> so that's why I argue this is not compatible with our society, that disclosure. As it is, as it is structured today, it is compatible with our old government. It is compatible with a democratic, republican form of government. It is not compatible with what we have now, which is a kind of invisible fascism. And invisible be because really people can't see it. Thank you. It's, I'm ready to wrap up. But, but I, I, had an, I had this epiphany uh, about a half a year ago. I was at a park with my children watching them play. It was a beautiful day. And they're playing with these other kids, having a great time. And I looked at them and I thought, none of these kids have an idea of the oppressive nature of our society. They're having a wonderful time. I looked at the adults, and they seemed happy, they're chatting. And I, and I asked myself a simple question. Can you have fascism if no one sees it? The answer is you can. The answer is you can. Because if you're not given the information, then you can, you're manipulated without knowing. And that is what we've got today. And that's why I say we have a media that functions precisely as Orwell's Ministry of Truth does. They are so good. And so what we are, we are like these points of light in the darkness. And that what we have to do is spread that light. We have no other choice. I don't know, I don't have all the answers about how we're going to transform society and create utopia, and we could have something really bad down the road. I don't know. But all I know is what we have to do. We have to do everything that we can in our power, maintain a life of integrity, and we have to have the courage to learn the truth, the courage to speak the truth, no matter how talented or not we think we are, if you've got this truth, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to stand out and be different in your neighborhood and your friends. All right, thank you. library, maybe one other is larger, Tim Crawford's. And so when disclosure comes, Ted is going to be driving around a Maserati, okay? And hopefully we'll be taking care of me. <laughs> we'll all be partying. Uh, so that's the other in the last announcement, taking up a little bit of time. So we'll, we'll, we'll launch. This is put us slightly behind during the day, but nothing serious. And remember, we've got two one-hour breaks in here, so it's not a problem. Oh, uh, one other thing. Uh, we still have tickets to Jaime Moussan. And uh, if you're not signed up for Jaime Moussan, you, you are making a grave mistake, all right? You have to be here for this. Jaime Moussan is uh, presenting now at, on, a, on a basis of four to five times a week all over the country of Mexico with audiences between one and 2,000 people. There is nothing comparable to that here, nothing at all comparable. Now, it helps that extraterrestrials have been, been traveling around over the skies of Mexico in vast numbers for almost 15 years. And if that were to happen here, you know, we'd be amusing, to say the least, and it would probably end the, end, end the truth embargo. But it's happening there, and one can speculate why that is. But Jaime did something that nobody else in this country has dared to do, though at any one moment they could do it. Ted Koppel would be nice. I'll try to make this suggestion to him or maybe to Peter Jennings. He's uh, in an awkward situation now. Maybe he needs to think about the future and the legacy. Uh, Jaime, in, in 91, changed his life. I mean, he totally changed his life in an utterly radical way. And all he did was what Frances Barwood did when she was at the council in Arizona uh, in 97. 
uh, there were people seeing things all over the skies of Mexico. And they didn't look like anything anybody had seen before. They clearly were not balloons. They, were, they took a few films. Jaime was doing 60 Minutes down there. He uh, took some of them, did a little show, and then, and he was, by the way, a very distinguished, high-profile guy. He's Mike Wallace down there, right? Very popular. Uh, and so he went on the show, and he, he did something really radical. He said, you know, there's something in the skies up there. It looks really interesting. I know that most of you have video cameras now. Please, would you please go out and take your video cameras and, and frequently check the sky? We cannot change that. Um, no, there is no way that we can change that, and that creates a fairly highly competitive situation with Michael Heiser. And uh, uh, I don't see a way around that. If I come up with one, I will, but that's fine. We will have a, uh, a, a, the benefit, a cornucopia of wealth. You cannot do everything at these conferences. They can be set up so you can, but there's a reason they're not. We want you to, to, to be coming back for more. We want you to know that there's more that you can see. So if you have to miss something this time, you get it the next time. Well, of course we want you to buy all the DVDs. That's a given, Ted. <laughs> By the way, we do have, we do have, uh, we do have uh, some staff now that are going to be working the, the extremely large uh, uh, de uh, tables out there for the, for the tapes. Uh, all of the ex-conference tapes, a uh, percentage goes to PRG, uh, and uh, you're helping us out with that. Uh, whether it's last year's or this year's. But Ted has, of course, several hundred thousand other titles and, and uh, puts in an unbelievable amount of work uh, to create those titles. Uh, and he's paid yeah, basically nothing. You know. <laughs> he doesn't get anything uh, to do it. Uh, but uh, he is building the largest license. And if you see something night or day, would you film it and send it to me? Fourteen years later, 25,000 videos, of which he was able to triage out approximately 22,000. Okay? Think about that, folks. Triaging 22,000 videos, eliminating the ones that were just, well, you know, a, a, number, a number of them down there uh, were as educated and refined as Jill Tarter, uh, who is currently with the chief scientist at SETI, and, and they mistook the moon for a UFO, too, and so they sent those films. But, but uh, they were quickly, uh, quickly uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, understood and triaged out, though I'm going to ask Jaime eventually to send all of those to Jill for her collection so she can have those. Know that she's not alone in that problem that she and her husband have, which is mistaking the moon for a UFO. Uh, but uh, he now there's about 3,200 that are pretty powerful. 3,200. What would happen if Gerardo Rivera, let's go up higher than that, Bill Riley, all right, or Ted Koppel, or any number of other pretty high-profile people. Uh, she uh, Shepard Smith comes to mind. He's had me on three times. Great guy. Love Shepard Smith. Okay. Simply goes on the national news and says, look, we're seeing some sightings out there. There's probably 200 video cams. They get better all the time. You can now zoom in and see the craters of Mars with the Sony whatever cam cam. And so it's like, why don't you all just carry those around with you and take some shots? You know what would happen? Within about a year, we'd probably have 10,000 videos in the hands of that news operation. It's interesting, no one's ever made that request here because if they did, they know what would happen, all right? But Jaime did, and Jaime has presented a number of times, but I asked him to come here. This will be the longest presentation he's ever given. It's the first time he's ever given a compilation presentation of everything since 91, okay? You want to be here for this. All right, now, we come to the meat of the heart of, of the exopolitical convention. We have. We have the uh, number of speakers. Will Durant, you know who Will Durant is? He and his wife 
wrote the history of civilization. Well, you know, a lot of other historians have gotten into this, except Jacobs. But Jacobs, while he's an historian, associate professor at Temple, he, 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 he didn't, he's not writing history. He launched into the study of the abduction phenomena, and he's an expert there. Uh, but no historian that I'm aware of has taken it on in that fashion. He's the first. First is great. First is cool. But it's also very tough. So he... He's easily one of the most lucid people. When you ever see him in a documentary, even some bad ones, he's the one that's going to sound, oh, that's, that makes sense, that's right, that's reasonable. Uh, he's got charisma, he's got photogenic abilities and stuff, which, you know, I used to have, but lost them somewhere. I don't know. How. <laughs> Could have been the medication, whatever. Uh, so he, he's, gonna, he, he's, like, he's like Jonathan Turley. He, he, in fact, he's got almost exactly the, the, the capabilities of being on screen as Jonathan Turley, who is a guy that got into this issue once, and I tried to get him in further, but he said, no, I did my time, that's it. And so now he's able to come on and talk about constitutional law and a bunch of other stuff. And Jonathan Turley is an important man, and I've invited him to both these conferences. We can't quite make it down here, but that's all right. He's, he's going to be the equivalent to that. You're going to see him on television. So he leads off on Saturday. Basic stuff, just like uh, Richard Souter is talking about the basement of the secret empire. He is talking about the base fundamental historical reality that in fact supports all of this. And the fact is, is that if there wasn't a single photograph of an extraterrestrial or a, a UFO anywhere, the historical record as he describes it is confirming of an extraterrestrial present. We'll just give all that evidence away, right? If you are discerning if you use your faculties and your intelligence and you apply rational thinking, okay? Which is what we're supposed to do. The original founders said, hmm, going to keep this thing going for, you know, five, six hundred years, going to have free state, going to have a whole bunch of rights, going to have a complex society, going to move on, move on, and we need a society of people that can apply rational thinking based on a good today. And they're deliberately chosen because well, they're all important, but the, there are certain, how would you say, key connections between the speakers today and this issue. Uh, and um, uh, the first one uh, here is not by accident by either, all right? Richard Dolan will be the Will Durant of exopolitics, the man who chronicles in a historical way, okay, Alfred Weber is, is, is not a historian per se. He's a futurist. Michael Sala is a bit of an historian, but he's more in the futurist area as well. He's really political science. Richard, in his unassuming way, uh, has uh, launched on that, that mode. Uh, again, in addition to his family, in addition to another uh, you know, business and career that, that pays the bills, and, and, and launched into history. Straightforward, matter of fact, back it up, do the, do the footnotes, you know, just be discriminate. Woo-woo is fine, but not for the history book. We'll leave it out this time. And he wrote UFOs in the National Security State, Volume 1, I think 47-73. Now, uh, that book has had enormous impact. It hasn't even begun to have the impact it could. It will sell many, many books once it's finally picked up, I think, probably at a very high-end publisher. But it's already sold through several levels, and he's self-selling and all that stuff. So the book's out there, and uh, it's only begun to sell. He's working on the second volume. 2006. Richard left school before he had his PhD. He was moving along, but things were happening. He had his PhD. I'm probably going to have to have a talk with him, right, and suggest when the first opportunity comes along, maybe go back and get that puppy. Because uh, as things develop, I'd like, to have, I'd, like to, I'd like to have that PhD by his name, uh, you know, two, three, four, five years down the line, okay, when he's going to be sitting up there with a whole bunch of academic muckety mucks, and they're going to be looking at me going, okay, you were right about the thing, you know, but I got a PhD and you don't, so like, don't get too uppity about that. All right? I know his wife, I know his wife Karen, would be helping to support him through that, that, those studies. I'm absolutely sure of this. Uh, so 